uh, after we do that, then to look at some more of the form controls. Um, this is the form we had last time. It consists of a simple text box where we can type in a search term. Click the button to submit, and it sends it to Bing, and we can see uh, the search results. Now, uh, a few things to keep in mind. Um, what's up here, what you see up here in the address bar, that is the URL. That becomes the action. Everything prior to the question mark is the action. Everything after the question mark is called the query string. And query strings always consist of a name for a value and a value itself. So if we look at what we sent to Bing, this part of it up to the question mark is the URL that gets called, which is the action. After it is the query string itself. And then Q equals World Series is that the Bing search engine expects our search term to be called Q. So whatever we're searching for, it expects to be called Q. And everything on the query string is the name of the value, an equal sign, and then the value. If there were more values after this, there would be an ampersand between them. So like in some advanced searches, you can do like for language. So there would be an ampersand, language equals, and so on down the line. Pardon me? You could make a broken search engine, right, that, that searched for, or you could make a search engine that uh, could only search for, for two things. Right. Yes. Yeah, I suppose you could do that. Yes, you could. I don't know why you would, but yeah, yeah, you could. Well, it's important sometimes to think through those things because that, that helps you understand it. So, I mean, I, I understand the question. Um, um, what you actually could do is you could, you could even do this if you wanted to. You could create a link on your page that said, search for World Series. And then if you clicked on that, it would do the search for you. So, yeah. All right. The key points from this uh, example to remember is, number one, the use of the form tag. Think of the form tag as being the envelope in which you're sending everything that you want to send to the server. All right. Um, in most cases, or in many cases, there'll be one form tag per page. Um, it is possible to have forms, it is possible to have pages that have more than one form on it. But in most cases, you'll have one page, uh, one form per page. The action and the method are required attributes on the form. The action is the name of the server-side script that is going to be processing the data from this form. The method relates to whether the data is passed on the query string or some other way. So method of get passes the data on the query string. This part is the URL that's going to be called. And again, either you're writing the, either you're the person that is writing the um, the uh, server-side script so you know what it's called or someone has given that to you. In the case of the example uh, for your homework assignment, I've given you the name of the server-side script. So that should be the action. So the form tag goes around everything that you're sending to the server. The action is the script that's going to process the data. The method is whether it's going to be passed on the query string, that's get, or in an invisible fashion, and that is post. We then have different form controls, and the two simplest ones, there is a text box, and then there is a submit button. 
The name of the text box, again, corresponds to the name that it needs to be. It needs to, the name of the text box needs to be whatever name the server-side script is expecting. So we know that Bing expects Q for the search term. So therefore, I have to make the name of this Q. Type equals text means it's a text box. That is a single line of text. A submit button, instead of type equals text, you have type equals submit. And the value is simply the word that appears um, on the button. So if we go back and look at this, it says search there because that's the value of it. All right. Now, text box is just one of the controls that, that we have in addition to, um, uh, in addition to the, the, the submit button. There's a number of other ones that have um, definite uses. And mainly, they relate to if you are going to, um, if you need to restrict what the user can enter in a particular field. Remember that a lot of times, a form like this is connected to a database. And I don't know if any of you have studied databases or not, but in many cases, data in the database needs to come in in a certain format. All right? Uh, it's not freeform data. It has to match a certain format. In which case, you can use some of these other things to ensure that. So let's start with a brand new example. And let's make like a site to register for, you know, let's make a page to like register for a site, you know, to create an account. And we'll use all of, um, we'll use several different um, form controls on this. Now, we're not going to submit this to the Bing search engine because the Bing search engine doesn't know about the stuff that we're going to be creating here. So I'm going to use pound. Now, you know what pound means from before, right? It means submit it back to the top of this page. Actually, that's done in many cases. Uh, we don't study server-side scripting, but sometimes pages submit the data to itself. And uh, the, the server-side script has two roles. One is to display the form, and one is to process the data from the form. So sometimes it's valid to have pound sign for that. All right, so for, if we're going to register for the site, um, we might have an input for the, ta for the name. All right. I actually should have kept what I had before and just build on it, but that's okay. And we might have a submit button. All right, if this is a site to register, you might have to enter in your password. And a password, instead of type equals text, the type equals password. And a lot of times, you enter in the password twice to confirm that you've entered it correctly. So let's go and save this and view it. And if I was registering for the site, I would have my user ID. I would have my two password fields. Notice, because it's a password field, when you type in it, it doesn't display. But you do have this little thing to show you what you've typed in. That way, you know, if you know that, you know, um, 
no one is in a position to see your password, you can click on that to make sure that you've typed it in correctly. Now, if we look at this, it's hard to tell what these fields are. So we're going to add labels to this. All right? We're going to add labels to this. And there's actually a label tag. And the label tag provides a couple things for us. First of all, let me just put, let me, let me not use a label tag and let me just put some text next to the field. All right. People that can see, it's easy to associate the label with the form control, right? In other words, what is the label? What is name? Well, name is the text box that's right next to name. What, do I, what am I supposed to type in here? Well, you look at the label that's right next to the text box. So people that can see have an easy time associating the label with the field control. But people that are accessing a site via a screen reader, it's not quite as easy. All right, so that's one of the reasons the label tag is created. With the label tag, you do this. You can say label for and it connects the label to the form control via the ID. So the screen reader will be able to associate the label with the form field. So this is an example of an accommodation that you make in your website for accessibility. It doesn't really look any different. But if someone has a screen reader and they're in this field, the label tag ties this field to this label. Now, I have to be sure I put the password in for all the fields. I did it for the name, but I forgot to do it for the two passwords. Form controls often have names and IDs because they serve different purposes. The name is used for the server-side script that's going to be processing it. The ID is used for things like CSS and JavaScript and also for associating labels with the control. So this code simply says this label name goes with this text box. This label password1 goes with this field. This label password 2 goes with this field. Now again, you can't see a difference, but it provides a valuable information for the screen reader to associate those two things together. That's the one thing that this provides. The other thing that this provides is we can actually use this in styling our page. All right? If we look at this form, this form doesn't look particularly good. All right, not at all, right? So what we can do is we can put some style onto this. 
So for simplicity's purposes, I'm going to put the CSS in the same page. Now that doesn't mean that you should start doing that. I'm just going to do it just as a time-saving technique. First of all, I can get rid of the bullet points. How do I get rid of the bullet points? Exactly, list style type none. All right, looks a little bit better. Now, it would be nice if all of these things lined up. So if all the text boxes like lined up right there. All right. And we can do that by going in and saying something like this. Label with 100 pixels, let's say, display inline block. Now the width part should be obvious. It's going to make it 100 pixels wide. The inline block might not be so obvious. All right. Um, we'll take a look at that. Whoops. So what that does is that pushes everything over. Without the inline block, this is one thing that catches me by surprise every now and then. Without the inline block, you can't set the width of something. The width is only a property that you can set on a block element or uh, an element that you've defined as inline block. So that's why you have to do both for this to work. Now we can actually do a little bit better than this, right? We could we could text align the fields to the right. And that would make it easier to I'd make it look nicer. I'm going to make this 200 pixels instead. All right. And then finally for this one, I can say something like class equals button. And I can say everything that has a class of button, make text align center. I have to put the dot before button because I'm re referencing a class. If it's an ID, right, there, there's, there's three there's a bunch of ways that you can reference elements on the page. The three most common ones is you can use the HTML tag, where you just use the HTML tag. You can use a class, which you use a dot in front of. Or you can use an ID, which you could use a pound in front of, the pound sign. So I could say ID equals button. If I were to say ID equals button, I would then say pound sign button. Okay, so our form already looks a lot better than it did before. And we just played with it for five minutes. All right, and we can do even more to that if we want to, and we'll come back to CSS um, later on. All right, now, those would be two of the different things that we could have, a text box and a password. 
Another thing that we can have is we can have radio buttons. Um, radio buttons um, are where you have a set of choices that are mutually exclusive. So let's say we have the residency. And you can only be in county, out of county, or out of state. Alright, so let me Now you can code this a number of different ways. I, uh, I'm going to take a look at how it looks now, and then I might adjust the appearance a little bit. All right. What are the key things with the radios, with the radio buttons? They have a type of radio. The name matches for all of the radio buttons in the radio button group. All right. That's important. All right. It's important because that's what makes it a radio button. If you were to give them different names, then it wouldn't act as a radio button. And what do I mean by acting as a radio button? I mean that if you click one, the others click off. They all have their, their own ID, however, all right, um, for use with the label. So if we were to look at this, all right, that kind of looks a little goofy. I might be able to um, actually make another little, there's a few different ways that I could deal with this. I'm simply going to make another a nested unordered list. In other words, my list for residency is going to include the list of the radio buttons.
and then the residency looks like that, and those line up. So that looks a lot better, I think. Yeah. Uh, if you wanted to display them in a line, what you would do would be something like this. What I would have to do, what, what jumbles them up, let's go and let's get this back to where we were. What screws this up is the fact that I've made the labels 200 pixels wide. So it makes these labels 200 pixels wide. So what I can do is I could put in a style for dot RB label. and maybe make a narrower width. Width. Fifty pixels. And then put a style on these that say class equals RB label. And that would work as well. Sort of. better. All right. Now these again are radio buttons. What that means is that they are mutually exclusive. So if I click one, it unclicks the others. That will only work if you give them all the same name. So in this case, the name is RB Res for all of them. That's what makes them act like a radio button. All right. And again, you would use this when there were a certain number of mutually exclusive choices. A person can't be a Loring County resident and also live out of Loring County. Or a person can't live in Loring County and also live out of state. These are mutually exclusive choices. Yes? Is there a default when you set up a Good question. A default? If you don't say anything, if you don't say anything, none of them will be checked by default. If you want them to be checked by default, if you want one of them to be checked by default, you can put in the checked property. And you can say, I want that one checked. And then that one is by default. You have to be careful picking defaults, because defaults will make your life for your user easier, but it can also lead to erroneous data. Because if someone didn't notice that field or didn't think to change it, you're liable to get the default when actually they should have selected something else. If you don't select anything, then that forces them to select it. But again, pardon me? Well, you could, you could have validation, right, um, that, would force them to, that would force them to select something. But if you default it, it's going to pass validation even if they haven't changed it. All right, and, and that's, that's something that potentially could be dangerous if the person doesn't look at the form. Um, so there's times to set a default and times not to set a default. Now, if I was doing this for Lyon County Community College, most students here are in county residence, I would say. So that would probably be a valid thing to default. All right. There are people who live out of county or out of state, but for the most part, um, that would probably be an okay thing to default. All right. Um, now, 
couple things to notice about this, and again, this becomes more important when you actually study server-side scripting. The value is what the script is going to get. All right? So what's in the label is sort of a user-friendly way to explain it to the user what that selection represents. But the value is what actually is going to get sent to the web server. So like if we press submit here, you'll notice RB res equals IC. So that's the value of the radio button. That's what gets sent to the server. And again, that's important when you come to databases. Maybe databases are expecting the data to be formatted in a certain way. And you have to match that formatting um, when you create your form to feed data to that um, table. All right, so that's a radio button. It's used when there's a limited number of selections. And it's especially good when there's only a few selections, like two or three. Now, you would never have a radio button with only one option. All right, because you could never unselect it. All right, once you pick it, it's picked until you pick something else. And if there isn't something else to pick, well, then you're stuck with that choice if they make it, and that's not good. All right, other form controls. There's a checkbox which is a yes or no question. So maybe have a, um, a field for whether they're a transfer student or not. Input type equals checkbox. The value represents the value that's going to get sent to the server if the checkbox is checked. If the checkbox is not checked, no value gets sent to the server. So let's look at this. There's our checkbox. I can check it or I can uncheck it. Now these operate differently than radio buttons. You don't have a group of checkboxes. Each checkbox is, is meant to be um, a, an independent thing, right? So if I had several checkboxes, I could answer them all of them yes, I could answer all of them no, I could answer some of them yes and some of them no. That's different than a radio button. A radio button, again, is mutually exclusive choices. These are standalone choices. I could check or uncheck. Notice that if I submit it and it's not checked, it doesn't send anything on the query string for it. There's the query string. The checkbox for transfer student is not anywhere on there. If I do check it, however, whatever value I have entered 
as the value of the checkbox gets sent on the query string. You typically use a checkbox for a yes or no question. You can also use a radio button for a yes or no question, right? Have a radio button and simply have two options, Y and N. All right? And as long as you have two options and they can pick one or change their mind and pick the other, it will work as a yes or no. A lot uh, of the specifics of form design uh, depends on how you want it to look and maybe keeping things consistent. So maybe if you're using radio buttons, you would continue to use radio buttons. Or if you had a bunch of checkboxes, maybe you'd use a bunch of checkboxes. So I, I guess you could, I'm um, saying is you could do this a few different ways. Even your assignment uh, to, to do the pizza thing, you could actually do that a couple different ways and it'd be acceptable answers. All right? Okay, the next thing is a drop down. And the drop down is one thing that does not use an input tag. It uses two tags, a select tag and an options tag. All right. So let's say we have We want to allow the user to select their major. And for simplicity's sake, we'll say they can only select one major. The drop down starts with a select. And again, what does the ID mean? The ID matches it up with the label so that people who are using a screen reader to access this web page can understand that that label belongs with that drop down. So I have a select. That indicates that this is a drop down. Within the select, I have a list of options. And the option has a value. And it has what gets displayed. So I'm going to make a small drop down with maybe three or four choices. Pardon me? I forgot the equal sign. Yeah, thank you. So this might be a list of majors that you can, that the, that the user can choose. So notice, all the options are inside the select tag. The select tag is what says, hey, we got a drop down. All right. The ID matches the ID of, the, uh, or matches the four of the label, so that for people who are visually impaired. Um, that association can be made by the screen reader. Each option consists of a value and it consists of stuff between the option tag. The value is like it is with the checkbox and the radio button, what the server-side script is expecting to get. Now again, 
This could be connected to a database. Maybe the database requires the three char or the four character code of the department, CISS, ACCT, uh, NURS, and so on. So we have to give the web server what it needs to do its job. And in this case, the assumption is, is it needs this four character code. Now, some people won't necessarily know what some of these four character codes are. That's why we have, between the start and end option, we have an English language description. We have a complete description so that someone can understand exactly what that means. So, there's our drop down, and we can pick what we want. Now, by default, drop downs only have one value. You actually can configure drop downs to have more than one value. You also can um, make it so that the drop down is higher, so you see all the selections. Now, again, whether you use a radio button or a drop down is largely a matter of how you want your form to look. All right, radio buttons and, and drop downs are pretty much interchangeable. All right, a lot has to do with how much space you want to have uh, to take up on the screen. All right. Uh, the advantage of a radio button is you see all the choices laid out there in front of you. The advantage of a drop down is that if you're not, if you haven't clicked on it, it doesn't take up a lot of space. So imagine if I were to go in and actually fill these out, all the majors, you know, there's hundreds of majors here on campus. You know, that would be a long drop down and, and you'd have to scroll through to get to it. But when the drop down is collapsed, you only see the selected option. Yes. 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 So the value is on the option. All right. And so you make the value different in the HTML. Now again, sort of a, a spoiler alert, if you were doing this with a server-side script, you would have your server-side script read the database and access these codes and create the options using those codes. But like in this case, I'm hard coding it. So if I select something and submit, if I look at the query string that gets generated, you'll not see what's between the start and end option tag. You will see absolutely nothing because I forgot to give it a name. That's a little catch, by the way. If it doesn't have a name, it doesn't get sent on the query string. The name set, the value is CISS. Again, and that comes from the value of the option not from this. We're going to do one more thing today real quick. Oh. That's true. Once you select it, you can't unselect it. Sometimes what you do is you put a dummy option. And, and that's actually a very good point. Um, to select the radio button, you have to say that it's, it's checked. A, def uh, a drop down by default always has a value. All right, so if I load this page up, it always has a value. Whereas a radio button, it has a value because I defined a, a default. If you do not define a default, the top item on the drop down becomes a default. Pardon me? Yeah, so, so if you want there to be no default, right, you have to make sort of a dummy option on the top that says, please select major. That would have a blank. 
Absolutely. Now, if it was something other than the top that you wanted, like, for example, if, if I made this an alphabetical list and, you know, I wanted CISS to be the default, even though it was the second item on the list. Then I would say, uh, I don't know my alphabet very well. I would say selected equals selected. And that would make that default. Or I could make, guarantee that it was the first one on the list. Um, there's a lot of skill in form design. Um, you want the most common things to be, you want, it to, you want, you want your, your drop downs to be easy for people to find stuff. Now what I've seen sometimes, like on websites, is um, like for example if they have a list of countries, all right, um, if they know for a fact that most of their users come from the United States or Canada, they will put United States and Canada at the top of the list, all right? And then maybe have the rest of the countries uh, listed in alphabetical order. That way you don't have to scroll down all the way to the U's if you're from the United States, all right? Um, so designing your form and designing what the defaults are and all that, that takes up uh, a lot of skill. The last thing, just to wrap up real quickly here, is... We have a text area. And a text area is where you have not just a single line, but you have multiple lines of, of, so that's usually for something that goes beyond a simple line of text, but something where you might allow the person to type in sentences and paragraphs and all that. All right, next time we're going to talk a little bit more about styling, maybe a little bit more about styling, uh, I don't know. We'll talk about a couple extra um, form tags that we didn't hit today um, that are associated with the form. And we'll talk about then HTML5 form controls. Everything we talked about today is a basic HTML4. You can use it in any browser in the world will understand it. The HTML5 controls that we'll talk about next time, there would be the potential for browser compatibility. And we'll talk about how there's sort of good news there. How if you use the HTML5 controls and your browser is incompatible, what happens? And it's actually not a horrible thing. So we'll talk about that more next time. All right, we'll see you up in lab.